Hello and welcome to Physics Frontiers, episode number 65, Causality, Time, and the Experiment Paradox. Today I'm going to be talking with Michael Eckstein of the Copernicus Center for Interdisciplinary Studies at Jagiellonian University. I hope I'm pretty close with it. Obviously, that's one of the greatest places anybody could ever work, uh, just for the name. That is the second best name of a place to work that I've ever heard for a scientist. And one of his co-authors has the best, which is the Vatican Observatory. Today we're going to be talking about different kinds of time order and how you can build up general relativity from them, as well as a paradox, the experiment paradox, that seems to generalize a number of different paradoxes in physics already. I think you'll have a good time. I like this, and I hope you will too. If you'd like to read any of the papers for this episode, they can be found in the show notes, which are at frontiers.physicsfm.com. And so let's just jump into the conversation with Michael Eckstein. Hello, Michael. How are you doing today? Oh, very good. Thanks. <laughs> excellent, excellent. What I wanted to talk to you about is some stuff I saw on the archive about time and causality. We've got a couple of papers that I saw, especially one was causality and time order, relativistic and probabilistic aspects. And that was with Michael Heller, I believe. And another one, which was operational causality in space time with Pavel Kordeki, and- Tomatz Miller. Yes, and Richard And Richard Kordecki. Richard is the father of Pavel Kordecki. So this is the father and the son, two of them. You also suggested we look at the experiment paradox in physics, and we might get into a little bit about that at the very end. It sort of intersects with a lot of things. Well, we just maybe let me comment that this, these papers are, like, I mean, the, the two papers, the, the one with Michael Heller and the experiment paradox, they are more, let's say, philosophical or generally conceptual stuff about physics. The one about operational causality, this one is more technical. Okay, it's, it's published in Physical Review. The others are, well, in more foundational journals. That's uh, different, but they are, of course, they are, of course, related. So I will be happy to talk about them. Excellent. So, I mean, I think the first one that I read was the causality and the time order. That is very philosophical, especially at the beginning. I mean, you're positioning yourself against Leibniz and Hume and people like that, right, um, at the very beginning. It's it's mostly the because of my co-author, uh, Michael Keller, who's a, well, he's a, he's a big philosopher. He won the Templeton Prize in 2008, I believe. And yeah, and he's also trained in, in physics and in mathematics, and he does regular research in, in cosmology, but his first occupation is, is philosophy. So this nice introduction is, is mostly his input, I would say. Okay. And so he saw something interesting in this previous research you'd been doing on causality and time order, and you put it all together. So that sounds like cosmology, since we're definitely dealing with relativistic stuff, and the philosophy and the more foundational stuff with time order causality and things like that, which are very tricky things. Yeah, I think what we both like with Michael is the interdisciplinarity. So the idea that you just don't close yourself in a narrow domain, uh, but you try to have a big picture, which well must include some philosophical issues, but also the technical stuff in, in physics. Okay, so you cannot really do one or another without, I mean, at least being aware of what's going on a bit outside. So that, that was the idea of the paper that we get together and I know the technical stuff, he knows the philosophy, so we can put it together. Now, looking through that, what really, both of these papers really, what really got me thinking was the fact that you were separating the two aspects of time, the chronology and the causality, and then merging them back together, which I thought was very interesting. I mean, apparently the way you're looking, it seems like that's more common than I thought, but I did think that was a very interesting thing. That That's what really got me thinking about the um, papers, is, you know, those two aspects. So I'd l- really like to just start with how these things interact with each other and so on. Well, okay, so first one needs to somehow define a framework in which we are talking, because of of course, the very idea of time or, or causation is, uh, well, it's uh, it's huge. It can be understood in multiple ways. Uh, well, in particular, causality is very often understood in terms of causal inference, like this statistical notion that you, you are looking into the correlations and you have this nice slogan that correlation does not imply causation, but you can have uh, some stuff which is correlated. And this might be because one is the cause or of another or the other way around, or they can have a common cause somewhere in the past. 
That's called the Reichenbach principle. But then in our papers, in most of them, let's say, um, we're really focusing on the relativistic notion of time and causality. Okay, so we're talking about space-time and we talk, when we talk about causality, we really mean relativistic causality, okay? So we're trying to somehow generalize it because I think, well, relativity is also, it's not just a, just a theory, but it's really one of the theories of physics on which most of the modern physics is founded. So it's really the, the framework in which one should consider these things. Do you want me to make a, like a brief overview of how causality is defined in, in GR or what's the... <laughs> That would be nice. So, I mean, we've got, yeah, we've got a lot of things going on. There are a lot of things, even just these papers uh, going on that uh, relate to them. But I think if we start off with something like that, that would probably be pretty pretty reasonable, I, I think, if we could just say, what does general relativity tell us about causality, if anything? Yeah, okay. In our paper, what we, what we do is summarize the kind of axiomatics of general relativity by Ehlers, Pirani, and Shield from 1972. Because, well, axiomatics is, is really, when you have axioms of a theory, you can really see what it's about. And then the axioms should be operational, so then, then you should be able to, to test them against some experiments and see if this axiom, this assumption about physical reality is, is right or not. So in GR, what, what they did is a kind of layered structure to tell you how different mathematical structures can be put on space. The first layer, the first level, is the set of, of events. So you need an event. It's a basic, basic notion, also a philosophical notion. Well, it can be anything like a click of your detector or, I don't know, a signal from a star, just a single event, okay? Well, then you have this set of events, okay? All of the events in the, in the universe and this set of events, you can call it a universe. That's everything that, that has happened and that will happen because the universe in this sense is a block, okay? It's, it's just there, it doesn't evolve per se, but it's, it's a big entity of all events. Okay, so first thing that you usually do, you need to put some, some topology on it and some smooth structure, some manifold structure. So that's the first thing you go into the manifolds, okay? Admittedly, it's, a, it's a quite a technical assumption and one can ask, okay, is it really needed? Is it useful? Uh, well, it is certainly useful because then you can use the entire Riemannian differential geometry, which is very nice and workable. But, well, probably it is not absolutely needed at the level of experiments. So you can go to some different stuff like causal sets that you mentioned in our correspondence or, or other stuff. But let's stick to the smooth manifolds for a moment. And then what you can do is you can put some partial order on the structure, which is uh, usually identified with the, with the conformal structure, so the causal cause. Okay, so we say which of the events are causally related to the other. This in physical terms, it means that the two events are causally related if they can be linked with a signal either a photon, so a null curve, which goes on the boundary of the cone, or a massive particle, which should go inside the cone along some causal curve. And then, so essentially you have this, at least in the EPS axiomatics, you have the conformal structure, which is just the light rays, and these are the cones. And then you have the projective structure, uh, which are the lines of, of massive particles. So this conformal structure is looking at what's happening with massless particles in space-time, right? In the space-time, yeah. we're still looking at it sort of like a block universe. That's right. That's right. Okay. This is basically everything inside that cone is sort of stuff where massive particles can play, right? Yes. yes. And then you have a projective structure is what those massive particles can do or are doing. Which one? Can do. Can do. Okay. Yes. All right. That's a, that it's, the causal structure says which of the events can possibly be causally related with each other. Excellent. And at this point, these are two different kinds of structures, and they're and at this point, they're not necessarily intertwined, right? Yes. We have, that's yeah. And I think you said in here that if either one of these happened, if either one or if either one of these didn't fit sort of the relativistic framework that we normally look at, there'd be different kinds of violations, right? So there'd be different ways that this didn't work. So I guess if 
you don't have the chronology, then you have an energy dependent speed of light. And you'd have difficulties with the dispersion of high energy massive particles on the projective side. So these are also independently testable. Yes. Well, these are independent structures, so you can test the two of them. And okay. it is being done. There are some theories, I'm not an expert on that, but I know it's, it's roughly called doubly special relativity. Yeah, we just did an episode on doubly special relativity to form special relativity, and I think there's another term for the same thing. Uh, it, they apparently were yeah. lots and so, lots of terms for the same thing. So as far as I know, they started, so the initial paper that was a famous nature paper from 1998, they had some postulate about the energy dependence of the, essentially the speed of light, okay, uh, and the gamma ray bursts. That was the initial idea, which was then tested with against some telescopes, and well, it doesn't seem to be to be the case, but it's still under investigation. But then there was some more recent papers by Giovanni Amelino Camelli and his group about neutrinos, which, well, as we now know, they they are massive. So this is technically that's that's testing the projective structure, not the, the conformal structure. Okay, excellent. So yeah, I just wanted to clarify that before we went on because now you're going to somehow bring these two things together, right? Yeah, then you need to synchronize them one way or another and that's that's called the vial structure. Well, okay, the, there is this um, whole procedure of, of, uh, of EPS, how you do it. So they have this system of signals and echoes uh, which allow you to ascribe space-time coordinates to, to every event. So essentially, you, you send a signal to um, something that can reflect your signal, and then you register it somehow. And from the time lapse of, of what's happening and your trajectory, you can, you can put the, the points there, okay? Yeah, and I should say that your explanation of that in the paper is excellent. I have an independent test. So while I was reading your description, I was drawing out what I thought you were saying, and then I looked up the old EPR paper or EPS paper, excuse me, yes. and those were the exact drawings that were in the paper. So you did a very good job of explaining it. Okay, so. thanks. <laughs> so then at the end of the day, because still the pile structure, uh, uh, well, then, then there's yet another compatibility condition, uh, which, which eventually gives you the metric structure. So the difference is, it's really about the synchronization of clocks and the difference between the vial structure and the metric structure is uh, sometimes called the second clock effect. This again is something that can be violated in some modified gravity theories, not in GR, because in, in GR, well, GR is a, is, a metric, is a metric theory, so, but you have all different kinds of Finsler geometries, stuff like that, where you do have the lengths, but it's not, uh, it's not a Riemannian geometry. Okay, but it does have the, the vial structure. And this kind of second clock effects uh, can also be tested and, and it is being done as, as far as I know. There are some bounds on, on how large can it be. And they're very narrow. <laughs> they're very narrow. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, done episodes on that as well. That it's very interesting the experiments that they do, but they just keep getting closer and closer and closer to to that point that is general relativity. It's really scary when you look at different things that you see cosmologically. That mm -hmm. when you actually test it, even though it looks like there might be some moving around from general relativity, if you actually test it, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of room to play. Yeah, that's that's right. So it seems pretty rigid, right? <laughs> yeah, so just to make the punchline, so at this moment there is no evidence at all that that anything can be wrong with general relativity. I mean, at least on the empirical side. Trouble start when we when we try to marry it with quantum mechanics, but yeah. <laughs> You're almost doing something like that here actually. I mean, that's looking at this, right? So we're definitely going to get into something like that in mm -hmm. just a few minutes. So just to maybe give the main idea. So my main idea about all these papers is try to somehow extract what is really essential in general relativity. What are the essential elements, like, I mean, for really doing physics and for, for having a consistent theory, but maybe slightly relaxing general relativity so that we don't quit this very narrow neighborhood, 
but still we can move a bit and see some new physics because that's that's the aim eventually that's why people do that kind of research right your, your kind yeah. of research yeah 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 but also sometimes my impression because i used to work in, in quantum gravity for quite a few years and uh, my impression was that sometimes people take it a bit too light saying that oh and then we have quantum gravity so there is no causal structure but i mean come on how can you not have a causal structure we you need to have some causal structure it can be well effective or emergent or, or whatever but i mean you do have a causal structure in, if you're doing experiments so you must have a mechanism which gives you that so so that that's my somehow guiding idea that you need to understand what this causal structure might be and then look for nice mathematical structures which can implement it. So yeah, at the bottom, there might not be a nice, well-defined, I guess what you'd call chronological time, but there still has to be some sort of causality, even if it is, as you said, effective or statistical or something. In the end, we know that something happens and because of that, something else happens. And yes. so much of that happens that we can actually assign these um, numbers to these numbers that we call time or whatever we want to call it. I don't know if that's the best way to put it, but we can add some sort of metric to it and say this this is a number here, that's a number here, even if that number might be a little bit different in this situation or that situation. That's right. So that's somehow, well, now we jump into the conclusions of this paper, but, but maybe it's a good timing <laughs> for this to happen. Anyway, so our main message from this paper was that you can say that you have two levels of say conceptualization so one is the effective level and that's the level in which you do experiments and you gather data you do experiments and have some outcomes inputs and and whatever and then you need to have some well you always have some notion of causality you always have some notion of time because if you if your detector clicks then your data comes in an order in a very specific order whether you ask for it or not, and it doesn't depend which labels you put on them, it always comes in some sequence, right? And if you have multiple detectors, you have some effective notion of a space because you know that these are separate things and these gives you separate data. So, well, you can call it whatever you like, but it's reasonable to say that, okay, they are space-like separated. So we have some notion of a space. Okay, so at least for this effective level, you need some notion of a space-time in the sense that you have some notion of time, which gives you the ordering of this empirical events, and some notion of space, which can distinguish different data sets. And you have some notion of causality, which essentially pertains to the correlations of what you observe. Then if you say that, okay, I have the, a limiting speed in the universe, let's say the speed of light, but if you don't like the speed of light, you can take whatever else if you wish, but there is a finite speed. Then this defines you this cone structure and tells you which of the events can be possibly causally related with another and which cannot. Okay, and this is something that you always need to have at the experimental level, empirical level, or effective level, whatever you call it. And you absolutely need this to have experiments. So that's the, let's say, the upper level. And then down under, you can have any crazy theory you wish, quantum gravity or whatever else. But you need to establish a link between the two layers if you want to make contact with experiments, okay? So that's the message, okay? And we're saying that general relativity is really well suited to model the space-time structure of this effective layer, okay? That's great, yeah. Okay, so... We're at that effective layer now. So we've got this general relativity thing going on. What is it about general relativity that makes it so useful as this effective layer? Mm, okay, so we have what makes it so useful. First thing is that super honest answer here would be that we don't know anything that is more useful than general relativity. In the sense that first thing is that it's been investigated for a hundred years. Okay, so we know the structure fairly well. It's quite well suited to what we observe. And also about, um, sorry, I got lost here a bit. <laughs> it's, uh... So it sounds like it's one, we know that it works quite well. I was thinking maybe the other part of that you were going to say is that, you know, one of the things you're showing is that what you're doing is consistent with this thing that works quite well, right? Yes. yes so yes. 
I think that's sort of, that's all we really need, right? At this point, yeah. unless there's something really special about GR that makes it more consistent than other things. I don't know if that's something you could say. Well, let's put it this way, because it, it really depends on the context of which you are thinking about general relativity. So one context is that, well, this is one of the pillars of physics. So if not relativity, then what? It's the same story like with quantum mechanics. I mean, what else is there? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's, it's really hard to imagine how can you possibly have anything different. And, and if you want, then you need to be sure what it, what it really means, what's the general context. So for GR, there are two things, I would say. One is the, say, the general conceptual structure, which I tried to outline. So all of the, the cones and the um, histories of particles, the metric, etc., etc. And this, as I said, is, uh, well, you can, of course, try to go beyond and say that, well, we might not have this smooth structure, but we might have some discrete space-time uh, causal set or something like that. But also one should say that the theory of causal sets or, or even some other loops or strings is certainly not that well understood as general relativity and nowhere close to the experiments as relativity is. But then another level you can say, that you can adopt, is that the static structure is okay, but what you want to change is the dynamics, so how this metric changes. And this leads to the so-called F of R theories. Okay, so you don't have the Einstein-Hilbert action as the dynamics of gravity and, and other fields of nature, but you have something else. And this, I would say, is quite amazing that, again, it seems that general relativity is really the simplest choice because, I mean, you can choose from all possible functions of, of Ricci curvature and you just have the linear one, <laughs> okay? So how is that possible? But if you try to compare it with the experiments, you see that, well, you can put bounds on some, on these other terms. And again, it's really narrow pass around relativity. So, so the honest answer is I have no idea why relativity works so well. <laughs> but it works quite well. All right. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I did want to ask you about some of these conditions. You had a chronology and causality conditions, and these had to do with closed timelike curves and closed causal curves, right? And both of which you wanted to get rid of, I think, because you wanted a temporal order. Is that correct? Yes. So the stuff I was talking earlier about this, um, the cones and the projective structure, these mm -hmm. are all local things. Okay, so this locally you can construct it in any space. But then comes a question if you're thinking about the space time as the universe or at least some part of it, the one which we observe, you can ask about what is the global structure there. Okay, it's in Minkowski space time, it's fairly trivial, it's the same globally as locally. Okay, it's just bigger, <laughs> but uh, but when curvature comes into play, either it can be because of a mass, like a black hole or, or a planet or, or a galaxy or whatever, or you can think about it in terms of cosmology, so the Big Bang and expanding universe, etc. And then comes the question, how does this causal structure behaves globally? Because you can say that, well, locally, I have my causal cone and I know that I cannot move faster than the speed of light. But it might turn out that if you move far enough, you stay in the cone still, but at the end of the day, you end up in the same event as you have started, although you were moving still around the causal curve. Yeah, so the causal cone in, in general relativity can actually uh, change direction. Unlike special relativity, where it's always basically the yes. same general relativity when you have a large mass or some other yes. strange events or uh, distributions, it can actually change directions and do very strange things in very strange situations. Yes, that's right. So that's the point that it, it's always the cone. It has the same shape locally. But once you move around, it can twist, okay? <laughs> and, uh, well, in a, some pathological situation, it can form a causal loop. And then, of course, th that was discovered by Gödel. That, that was the first, which year was that? I think it was 49, I guess, Kurt Gödel discovered that there are solutions to Einstein equations, actually. So not just arbitrary space things, but solutions to actual Einstein equations, which do have this property that you have closed causal curves. 
Okay, and then philosophically, it, it gives you all kind of troubles saying that, okay, so suppose that you move around this curve and then you meet your grandfather and then you try to do something wrong to him, <laughs> but that affects, of course, yourself. And Yeah, there are little problems with that that show up in science fiction novels mostly, right? Yes, 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 yes. Of course. So that's, that's the problem about the logical consistency of, of the theory, okay? Then there are some conditions you can put on your space-time, like global conditions, which tell you that you should avoid this kind of pathological situations. Okay, so one first condition, the mildest is the, well, there are, there are different of these conditions. It's a whole, it's called a ladder, because there are, there's a ladder of stronger and stronger conditions. So one is simply that it should be causal, so globally causal, which means that you have no closed causal curves. Okay, but then you can ask, well, okay, but suppose you can come arbitrarily close to a closed causal curve, okay? Well, this might be dangerous because this is not stable, right? Because, I mean, if, if you're thinking in terms of some physical evolution, there's always some uncertainty. Okay, something can jiggle a bit or so, and then it's again risky. And on the formal side, it also causes trouble with the say, definition of a field like a global solution to say Maxwell equations, for instance. So then, okay, there, there is this a nice notion is, is that of a stable causality, which, and here comes the time, and it's, it's really amazing. That's a theorem by, by Hawking, the famous theorem that if you have a stably causal space-time, which is very precisely defined in terms of no closed causal curves in any neighboring metrics, so you look in this big space of possible space-time metrics, and you say that in a neighborhood of a metric that you're considering, there should be no closed causal curves. Hawking theorem shows that this condition is equivalent to the existence of a global time in the universe and so a cosmic time if you wish and then it's it's really amazing it's it's a very powerful theorem and very thought-provoking i would say i mean that's not a unique time is it it's not unique by by no means yeah okay but there is sort of a global time and this yeah. is going to let you kind of yeah. make little time slices over the entire universe yeah, that's right. So if you think in terms of Minkowski space-time, the easiest to imagine that if you have a free-falling observer, he cuts his Minkowski space-time into these slices, but you can choose a, an inertial observer which travels with some speed, and then he will have these slices tilted by some angle, but it's still still the slicing, okay? So you still have the global time flow. In general, in stably causal space-time, you can, you can do these different slicings, but you know that at least one exists. And if you don't have this condition, then, then it's not globally possible. You can do it only locally, but if you try to cover the entire space-time, it's not going to be possible. So there's no global time there. Just to recap, you're saying that these um, causality conditions eventually allow you to say that we can basically put coordinates on all of space-time. We don't have just little patches for different patches of space-time. Is that correct? Well, it's not really coordinates. I mean, because coordinates is something that's related to the very concept of a manifold. Okay, so you have a manifold, which is not a flat space-time, but in a flat space, but in every point, around every point, you can approximate it by a flat thing, right? So that's the usual picture. But usually there is no single coordinate chart which can cover your entire space. Like even on a sphere, you cannot really cover the, the two poles at the same time. You need at least two to cover it, okay? And that's the same story about the space-time or, or a physical universe, if you wish. But if you have this global slicing, it's not really about coordinates, but it's about a time function, okay? So that's the technical way you define it. A time function is a function which takes elements of your manifold, so event, and gives you a real number, okay? And then it should be such that it's, well, it, it is, increasing along every future directed causal curve okay okay yeah that sounds reasonable That's but it's it's a number but it's not a coordinate you can assign that number and the future has a larger number than the past yeah okay that's reasonable i think we can get that yeah okay. <laughs>
Okay, so now that you have that, you have some sort of derived conditions as well, right? Like this no signaling condition. So those are really derived conditions. You can find all these things with these really nice properties. So when we're looking at something we're trying to deal with later on, if we're trying to build another theory or something, it has to have this no signaling condition and so forth. Is is that correct? Is that the way to interpret these next set of conditions? Because now we're switching into this other paper with uh, with Horodetskis, which is maybe a good a good moment, because the point is the following. So all of the stuff that we were talking about, causality conditions and everything, as you said, it's it's only potential in the sense that it, it doesn't say which events are really causally related with each other, but which can be causally related with each other or not. Okay, and now the tricky point is that if you really want to, and that was a long-standing discussion also in, in general relativity, that, that this grandfather paradox, if you really take it seriously, then you need a bit more than just a causal curve, a closed causal curve, because you need to be sure that you're able to convey information along this curve, at least that or any physical stuff like energy or whatever, but it boils down to the same thing. If you can convey the information, then it is a paradox. But just from the fact that there exists such a curve doesn't necessarily imply that you can use it to really create the paradox. And this brings us to the famous, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's related to the to the famous EPR paradox, where you have the two particles which are space-like separated, okay? And seemingly, if you make a measurement on one, then it immediately affects the measurement of the other, I mean, the outcome of the, on the other. But the point is that, and you say, well, there's an instantaneous transfer of information because these things can be far apart. But the point is that there is no information transfer in this process. Okay, it's non-local, but there is no information transfer. You cannot use an EPR pair to transfer any information. So there is no violation of causality. And in this sense, quantum mechanics with all its weird stuff, entanglement, randomness, is not at odds with relativity, with the causal structure. And so unfortunately for Orson Scott Card, Ender's Game doesn't work. You can't take a joystick on the Earth and control a spaceship seven light years away. That that sort of stuff doesn't actually work out, no, no matter what you think. Okay, so... Um, so that would be the principle of no signaling, to put it in words, that no information can be transferred between space-like separated regions. Space-like, which means that they are not causally related in the sense of GR. But the, the tricky point is that, again, to say that things are space-like separated, you need some notion of causality. And this notion should come either for GR or whatever else you wish, but you need to have one <laughs> to start with. And you had one, right? You had this CE condition, this causal evolution condition that yes. you were looking at. So that was one of the things I really wanted to talk about, right? So, okay. Okay, sure. so that's, that's something that we started with, uh, with my friend Tomek Miller. So our point was the following. So suppose we start with a space time. We always start with a space time and it's a nice space time. So it's stably causal and it's even a bit more, it's globally hyperbolic. That's a bit more technical saying that uh, there is a well-posed Cauchy problem. So all of the initial equations, uh, initial value problems, we have some initial data on a time slice, then you can evolve it throughout the universe. And if you have a globally hyperbolic space-time, which means that if you specify the, the data on a single time slice, then it specifies through Einstein equations the, the entire content of the universe, the past, because you can evolve it one way or the other. So all the information is on the time slice. The question we, we asked ourselves is that, okay, so the things in quantum mechanics, they are non-local. What it means? Well, it means that you have a, a time slice, because if you have a particle, it's a classical particle, it's, it's here and there, okay? It's, it's just one point on your time slice. But if you have quantum mechanics, you cannot describe it this way, because you have a wave packet which is spread around the space. Thing. And if you look into some theorems in quantum field theory, they are going to tell you that it's actually the fields from quantum states, from quantum field theory, 
they are actually spread over the entire space -time. So there is non-zero probability of detecting a particle at very remote end of the universe. So we started with a formal question saying that, okay, so can we have some notion to say what it means that this spread out objects, they are causally related or not? As you can imagine that you have some probability distribution on one time slice, and then some other probability distribution on some other time slice, okay, some later time slice. And uh, okay, if it's just a single point, because well, a single point is a very nice probability distribution, which is one here and zero everywhere else, then you know exactly what it means that whether they are causally related or not. But if you have something spread or even a collection of points, like two points or three points, then what it means that they are causally related or not. So this brought us to this nice idea of, of optimal transport, which, uh, which goes back to the 18th century. And it started with a question put by Monge, how to move a pile of a sand from one place to another in an optimal way. Okay, and we adopted this, uh, this idea and saying optimal in our case means causal. And that's the only thing that we demand, it should be causal. So our definition, this causal evolution that you mentioned, uh, what it essentially says is that if you have, let's say, one probability distribution here and another there on a later time slice, they are causally related if and only if every single bit of probability, every infinitesimal part of it, travels along some future directed causal curve. Well, that's purely formal, but we discovered that there is another way you can characterize it, saying which turned out to be operational, and that's good, which means that suppose you take any any compact set, so any nice closed bounded set on your time slice, and you say that, well, our two probability distributions are causally related if the probability cannot leak out of the future cone of this set, okay? So the idea is, is very simple, because if it would, then it means that you have some excess of probability, like I mean leaking out of this causal cone. And then what you could do is you could use it to send signals. Why? Because suppose you have an observer waiting for your signal on, on the later time slice. And if he knows that if you send the signal, there's going to be an excess of probability, which means that if you send a lot of signals, then he's going to see the difference. And this is signaling. So this is sending information. Okay, so that's why we say that, okay, this should be forbidden, this kind of statistical signaling because otherwise, well, yeah, you transfer information. And this is really what our condition says. And somewhere in there you said that this does not quite all by itself imply the no signaling condition. You needed to go a little farther with it. Yeah, that's right, because, okay, so on the formal side, it means that we're going to, from points to events in the space-time, we're going to all probability measures on the space-time which, okay, it has some other mathematical interpretation. Okay, you said you're not scared about the technical details. So, <laughs> so let me just say that, okay, if you have a space time, you can associate with it an algebra of functions on it, flex values, okay? And that's a, there's a very nice Gelfand duality. So you can associate a point. So you can recover a point by looking at the functionals on your algebra of functions. And the functionals are the evaluation functionals. So we take a, like a delta of f is delta p of f is f of p. Okay, that's the so-called Gelfand duality. But this delta of p are just the extremal functionals, so pure points, uh, pure states, uh, in other words. But there are also the mixed states, and the mixed states are exactly the probability measures, Borel probability measures on space-time. So the mathematical questions was really about extending this causal relation, causal order, to this huge space of all probability measures. And this, what we have shown, that you can make it, and it's fairly nice, fairly, well, it, it's a consistent theory, it's a nice partial order, we have a nice proof of that, and so. And then we had some kind of intuition that, okay, it should be related with no signaling, because, uh, well, if there's an excess of probability outside of the cone, then there's an observer who can read it out. But then we met with the famous family of, of Horodetsky, who are the big names in quantum information theory. There's actually four of them. There's a father, Richard Horodetsky, and he has three sons. 
Paweł, Michał and Karol, and all four of them are working on quantum information. Okay, and they have a famous reviews of modern physics paper by Horodetsky, 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 and Horodetsky. <laughs> Excellent, yeah. So anyway, they, they somehow got interested in our papers and uh, we started talking and they said, well, okay, but you see, it's not that easy with the signaling because, well, if you want to send information, you need an agent. You need a receiver on this second time slice, but you also need some sender, okay? And the question is, what does he do? So somehow the discussion that, that led the four of us to finally put it in this paper, operational causality in space-time, we said that, okay, so our axiom about the causal evolution of measures, that's one thing, but then you need some, some axioms, something about the measurements, which should then give you the no-signaling principle. Okay, the logical structure is that, for instance, one, one easy assumption that you can make is that if you make a measurement in a given set, and you have some outcome, then the information that you got cannot exit the cone, the future cone of the set in, at any later time. That seems quite reasonable because if you measure something and you put it in your notebook, then you don't want to throw your notebook outside of your light cone. So that's the somehow basic rationality be, behind this, uh, this axiom. And you can have some other axioms concerning what happens if you don't measure the signal. And if you put all of them together, they form a nice logical structure with those signaling. So formally what we can show, for instance, is if you assume this axiom about the measurement, so that if you measure it in a compact set, then it stays in the causal future. And you assume this and you violate our causal evolution condition, then there's always a protocol which allows you to send information beyond the light cone real information, which if you combine it with a, well, you can construct a protocol with two observers mutually traveling at different speeds, then you can form a causal loop and then you have a genuine paradox. This one is not enough, but if you combine it with some reasonable axioms about what it really means to measure something, then you can you can say what's the no signaling principle here. And in many of these papers you had a uh quote, what is it, unperformed experiments have no results? Yes, <laughs> it's, it's the famous slogan of Perez. Yeah, because that's the point. If you don't make a measurement, then you, well, yeah, <laughs> you don't convey any information. And th that's tricky. If you think of it, one has to get used to it because you have a detector and it doesn't click. It gives you no information, apparently. But if you think about it, it does give you an information and the information is that there was no signal. And that's a different story as compared to the case if you don't have a detector at all. Because if there could have been a signal, but there wasn't, that's an information which you can use. And if you don't have a detector, you, well, you don't have an outcome. <laughs> okay. On this line, is there anything more that you think is interesting before we talk a little bit about your experiment paradox? Well, there are, of course, a lot of interesting issues, but I think that might be the good moment if we go to the experiment paradox, because as you see, we, we had this formal structure of causality and stuff, but then you really start thinking in terms of operations and operationality, information transfer. And I told you that the missing point in what we did with Tomek was, the, was an observer, an agent. Actually, not a relativistic observer, because a relativistic observer is, well, he's, he's completely passive. He cannot change anything. He can observe, but just observe. And if you're talking about information transfer protocols, stuff like that, you need an agent who's able to make a change somewhere. Okay, and, sure. and this really brings us to this paper that we entitled The Experiment Paradox, that's co-authored with Pavel Korodetsky. Now, in this paper, you're looking at basically the same sorts of ideas, but now you're saying, okay, well, what's happening with this experimenter and the experiment and how they're related to the past? Is, is that more or less? Those are the three things that I'm seeing on top of what we've been talking about previously. Sure. Okay, so uh, well, let me explain what the paradox really is about. Because, well, it all started with uh, Pavel, he's a, he's a great specialist on, on, uh, on bell tests and uh, quantum non-locality and stuff like that. So you have the bell theorem, which tells you that under some assumptions, if you make a measurement on two separated space-like separated particles, and then you gather the statistics and then you make a suitable combination of what you got, then a certain number measuring the strengths of these correlations cannot exceed two. 
And then people did the experiment once Bell put, put his famous theorem and they discovered that this inequality is violated. And it is violated precisely by the amount as predicted by quantum mechanics, which means two square root of two, which is really larger than two. Okay, so that's a matter of fact that the Bell inequality is violated in nature. Okay, there were zillions of experiments, very recent. But then the big question is, why is it violated? So this is a question about the assumptions of the Bell theorem. So one of the assumptions is the, it's called the local realism, which is the one that fails in quantum mechanics, uh, which means that the particles have properties predetermined and independent of the fact whether you measure it or not. And this is not true in quantum mechanics because in some way, these properties of the particles, so the measurement outcomes only materialize when you make the measurement and they do it at random. Okay, so that's one way that you say, well, this assumption fails and that's quantum mechanics. It's not classical, it's weird, but that's how it is. But then, of course, you say, but hey, there must be some other assumptions there. So what are they? And there are three more in the Bell test. So first one is the space-like separation. So you really need to have your experiments far away from each other and the particles, because if they are just very near, then you can always say that, well, of course, there is some weird correlation, but that's not because there is quantum mechanics or non-locality or whatever else, it's just because they communicated with each other one way or another. So you really need to be sure that the experiment takes place far away and it's done fast enough so that you're completely sure that well, if you assume that there is nothing that can exceed the speed of light in vacuum in nature, then there was no possibility that there was any information transfer between the parties. So they could not have got correlated about after the measurement was made. So that was the assumption of locality. And this is very non-trivial to meet in an experiment because you really need to be, well, the speed of light is, it's fairly big. So you really need to make these things far apart and make the experiment quick. And that was done only in the 2015, actually. Move on, the second assumption was about the so-called first sampling. Because, well, no detector is perfect. So you always have some noise, some dark counts, et cetera, et cetera and some missing photons. And that was already observed by Bell that if you don't get enough of photons, then you can always explain the statistics by saying that, well, this is because you're not measuring everything that you should. And he precisely estimated the amount of photons that you need to catch for this or, or other particles that you need to catch to be sure that there is no way you can explain it by putting the blame on all the other particles that you don't register. And for this, it's called the CHSH um, well, inequality, that, that's the standard one people do in experiments. I don't remember the exact number, I think it was around 80%, 83 or so. And again, it, it was very technically challenging to overcome this assumption. And it was done in the 2010, I think there was the first experiment. And in 2015, there was three experiments, four actually in total, that closed the locality loophole and the first sampling loophole at the same time. So they used very good detectors with uh, more than 90% of efficiency, and they did it well se space like separated with fast detectors. So these were closed. But there is the third loophole, which is of a quite different nature. And well, it says that the theorem holds as long as you assume that your measurement settings are random. Okay, so they are not correlated because, well, Obviously, if you think in terms of Alice and Bob, if they pre-agree on how they are going to measure things, then you can obtain any correlation you wish because it was all pre-agreed. So you can always use this kind of conspiracy theory argument saying that, well, it's all fake because people pre-agreed. But then the question is, are you willing to put the conspiracy theory on nature itself saying that, well, maybe this is really pre-agreed in nature. Okay. So, well, you can somehow push this condition further. And there were some nice experiments by Anton Seilinger's group. And so they were using some light from distant stars to choose the settings of your Bell tests. So they would say, okay, we don't touch upon it. It's just chosen by the stars. Okay, and then once it's, it's there and you draw the space diagram, you can say that, well, okay, it could have been 
predetermined. It could have been pre-correlated, but it must have been a few billion years ago. Okay, so then again, you're pushing your conspiracy theory to the limit. But with Pavel, we realized that the real point here is not about whether it's in us or it's in nature, but the really tricky point about Bell test is that it's a conditional statement saying that if your measurement settings were chosen randomly, then the outcomes will also be random. Okay, and you can actually make this statement more precise and even quantify it. And it's the domain called the randomness amplification, saying that you can actually construct a quantum algorithm, which if you feed it with something that, that is random, or at least you believe it's random, then it's going to give you something which can be more random in the sense that it has more 50-50 Okay, better, better balanced distribution. Okay, but then we come back to the question saying that, well, okay, we say that quantum mechanics is random, but eventually to prove that it is random, we need randomness from somewhere else. So <laughs> where does it come from? Okay, it seems like a kind of a vicious circle, okay? Because also from the cosmic point of view, I mean, wh where could it come from? There was a big bang and then the galaxies form and everything, so it's a whole huge evolution, so where is the place for any randomness here? Okay, and then eventually we managed to pinpoint the problem and we call it the experiment paradox. And so the paradox, roughly speaking, is the following. So suppose you have a, some physical system, you have a model of it, say it should behave this way and that way, and you need to test your theory, your model. So you need to make an experiment on your system and compare the outcomes with the predictions of your theory and see if they match or not. Of course, you can never do it perfectly because you cannot control the system perfectly. You cannot control the noise. There's always some uncertainty, some heat or some noise or, or whatever. So we always have some statistical significance. And then it's, uh, well, it's up to you if it's convincing or not. It's fairly obvious what's going on. And you have the, for instance, in particle physics, there is a, the gold label is the so-called five sigma level. So if the statistical significance is, is five sigma, then it's it's called a discovery. And then we have seen a stuff which were lower and eventually they turn out to be some fluctuations, some statistical fluctuation. You can test the models, okay? But in principle, you can test them. And in principle, you can make your experiment more precise and you can make your model more precise and test it test it more and more and more, and eventually you believe that there exists some model, which is the true model of your physical system, you can access it as some asymptotica. Okay, so if you have if you would have infinite resources, then you would narrow and narrow and narrow the in the space of models and then eventually you would get to the right model. But the tricky point is that if you want to test a physical system, you need to interact with it. And you need to interact with it in a random way. Random means unexpected by the system itself. Because if you use anything that is pre-correlated with the system, then your experiment is not right because you don't control your input. So somehow that's the conspiracy theory, okay? That's, that's pre-correlated, so you cannot trust your outcomes because it was pre-correlated. So you're not really testing the model, but something weird is happening. But the point is that if you now say that, okay, I'm taking something random and putting it on my model, on my physical system, it means that you have changed your physical system in some new way. So it's a new physical system. If you prefer in terms of epistemic terms, it's a, it's a new model. So you need a new model of the perturbed system which is different than the model of the unperturbed system. Because obviously it's different and it must be because you must feel the difference, all right? So that's what we call the experiment paradox. In short, that, that you must assume that your input is random, your experimental input is random to be able to test a model in a valid way. But if you do so, then after every experiment, you actually change your model. That's what we call the experiment paradox. And we're saying that well, there are different aspects of it, and one of them is the measurement paradox in quantum mechanics. So that's the experiment paradox. Okay, that was the point of those four different examples in the box then. 
Okay, here they are. You had these four different examples. The first one was the measurement paradox. The second was a preparation paradox. The third one was super determinism. And the last one was scientific pragmatism. And are these all different ways to set up your experiment paradox? Different ways of looking at it. Well, what's roughly speaking the, the measurement paradox in quantum mechanics? The measurement paradox is the following thing. So suppose you have a wave function or whatever quantum state. But once you measure it, you don't have the wave function that you measure, but you have some projection of it. So you make this von Neumann projection and it projects onto an eigenstate. So the big question is, okay, but how does it really happen? So who does this projection or what does this projection? Okay, so one way you can say, and that's the typical way saying that, well, okay, there is no actual projection, but there is some interaction with a big environment. And since the environment is big, you have the coherence and you lose track of the details. Okay, the details of that are not completely understood, whether it's really quantum mechanics or whether you should put some nonlinearity there, whatever. But somehow the idea is that, well, okay, it's still a quantum state, but it's, it's very much. But then the point is that if you look at it like very rigidly, you say that a quantum state is a quantum state and a classical bit is a classical bit. So in a sense, if you write a number in your notebook, that's classical information. And it must be so because anyone in the world should be able to read it and use it. And it's an objective bit of information. And if you have a quantum state, it's always probabilistic, even if it's tiny probabilistic thing, but it's never classical. So in this way, you say that it's never guaranteed that the experiment outcomes that you have registered, let's say a hundred years ago, would not flip one day to some other numbers just because they are quantum, so <laughs> this might happen. Yeah, I think that's happened to me sometimes. That's also true, that's also true. <laughs> that's also true. But fortunately, and for some reason, this is not something that we observe in, at least in science. Well, of course, that's a big question if you burn down a library, which did happen in the history, and shamefully, it's still happening all around the world, whether the information is really lost or not. I mean, at least from the viewpoint of quantum mechanics, it's not lost. It's still there somewhere, maybe in the air. Uh, but the whole process of burning is a unitary operation, which transfers all your information to some other degrees of freedom. But it's it's all there. Okay, you just would need to decode it. One way of looking at this, this experiment paradox is that there is there's no definite outcome, never ever. Okay, and then we had this preparation paradox. Now suppose that you're just doing classical mechanics, okay? And you have some equation of motion of, I don't know, a ball that's rolling over the table or so. Okay, and then you want to test this model if this is a good model of my ball or not. And then what you do, well, you say, okay, if I put some initial position and initial velocity, I, I push it then and I register what's the final position and final velocity, I can see if my model is good or not. Okay, but then once you do it, you say, well, but, okay, but after all, I did push the ball, okay? It was not just the ball, but it's a ball with, a, with my muscles or my hand or, or whatever else I used to push the ball, okay? So I should take this into account, but then you have a different model. Okay? You say that, well, I have a model, you can call it a model with a source. So there was some external force acting on the ball. And if you take this into account, then you have a different model, which again, you can test. But then to test it, you need to use some other device or force or maybe your second hand to test the model. So push your right hand with your left hand and then the ball. But then again, you, you end up with the same problem saying that, well, but again, I have another source, so I should change my model. So this is what we call the preparation paradox, because then if you try to think, then you're going back and back and back and saying, well, okay, so where does it really begin? Okay. And then the third instance of this experiment paradox, if you try to apply it in cosmology, you can call it cosmic paradox. As I told you, if you have a globally hyperbolic space-time, then anything you put on a time slice determines exactly all the past and the future of the universe. So now you have your, say, matter on a time slice, okay? the configuration of matter on a time slice in the universe. Now suppose you, you take by hand and change the position of two particles in here. You are going to have a different configuration of masses or energy densities on the time slice, which means that you are going to have a different evolution of these data 
into the future, but also into the past, because it needs to be consistent. So to have a nice picture, you can look at it in the following way. So suppose you, well, you want to observe some distant star and you have a committee which is going to decide whether you're going to put your, your telescope in, say, South Africa or maybe Chile. Okay, and the committee takes a decision, say, okay, it's going to be in Chile. And then you put it in Chile and then, okay, you observe the star according to some GR model. But then you say, well, if you look at it really rigorously, then you say, well, but the configuration of matter with a telescope in Chile is different slightly, only slightly, but it's, it's different than the configuration of matter with a telescope in, in South Africa, okay? So what is going on? Either you say that the committee didn't really take any decision, it was all predetermined by the past because, well, the star that you're looking at is, well, you're looking at it as it was a few million years ago, okay? So either you say that it's actually the decision of this committee to put the telescope in Chile was already predetermined way back in the past, but then you arrive at the point and say, okay, well, what's the point of having all these committees, et cetera, at all? <laughs> uh, or otherwise you say that, well, this decision was genuine, was random. The information about this decision was nowhere in the universe, which means that by this decision, the committee has affected the very star that they are going to observe. <laughs> okay, so of course one has to keep in mind the scale. So if you really do the math and write down the equation, you're going to see that the difference is completely negligible here, so you're not going to feel any difference in the stars. Uh, but the real point is that, that this is really a paradox about the, what you can do in principle, not about what you can do in practice. Because in practice, you always have some uncertainties, you always have some noise. And actually, that's the blessing. Because our message is that if you would have infinite resources and you would be able to make sharper and sharper and sharper models and sharper and sharper experiments, then at some point you would run into some inconsistencies because either you would say that, well, it's all predetermined and my experiments don't make any sense any longer because I'm not testing anything. I have no choice at all. There are no competing scientific models, so it has to be as it is. Or you say, but well, I'm changing the universe every time and I'm testing different models. So it seems like this very fact that we have limited resources is the blessing. And that's why we don't see the paradox. Okay, so it's really a kind of philosophical paradox. Okay. Good, good. No, I mean, the whole point of a paradox is, is you can logically prove that something is one way, but you know from experience that it's the other way, right? But, you know, through everything else you sort of agree on, right? I mean, going all the way back to Zeno and stuff like that, you can look at these very simple things that you should be able to agree with, and then you drive something that you know is wrong. You know it doesn't actually apply, so now you have to figure out what really is the issue there? What really is the problem? And, and that's what makes paradoxes so interesting. Yeah, they are thought-provoking. That's just to be by saying that we have an experiment paradox. By no means I'm saying that science is useless and we should not be doing it. It's just what we're trying to convey with Pavel that, that there is a really big problem in the foundations and we really need to rethink the foundations and the methodology and try to somehow overcome it or maybe find a different way of thinking about it. So we hope it's, it's thought-provoking. <laughs> exactly. That's what makes these things so useful. Like I said, this is a very, very interesting paper, and um, we could like talk about so, this sort of stuff forever, right? Um, well, maybe not forever, but for at least another hour, but probably we shouldn't. <laughs> so is there anything else that you'd like to end with? Do you think people should um, think about it? You've gone through a whole lot. Um, this has been very yeah, informative. Yeah, I, I did quite a lot of talking in my <laughs> in the last part, <laughs> so I, I think I said what. Uh, well, I hope I did answer your questions and and uh, try to to sell the ideas more or less. And uh, I think I, I sold my message. So let me say, okay, so the take home message is that if you're looking at science, you should really take an interdisciplinary perspective. It's not that simple that, okay, I'm a physicist, I don't need to care about philosophy because you always use some philosophical notions, we call it primitive notions, 
whether you like it or not. If you say that, well, something is space-like separated or there is some time or there is some information, you're using the philosophical concepts, which were studied by the philosophers since the antiquity. So, so it's good to keep track also what were the, the thoughts there. But it also goes both ways. So if you're a philosopher, you should be tuned up to what's going on in physics and in, in the fundamental physics because it does affect the, the natural philosophy, at least the philosophy of, of science. So it's uh, it's really you should you should adopt this this wide perspective, the holistic perspective, if you wish. <laughs> Excellent. Well then. Thank you very much. This has been very, very interesting, and I'm very glad I've had you on today. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me today, and, and thank to all of you who are, who are listening to this podcast. And <laughs> you have just listened to Physics Frontiers episode number 65, Causality, Time, and the Experiment Paradox, with Michael Eckstein. Show notes for this episode can be found at frontiers.physicsfm.com slash 65. Show notes for this episode include Michael's papers, as well as links to related episodes and so on. I'd like to thank Michael one last time for coming on, and I'd like to thank you very much for listening. Bye now.